Turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, is where we're picking up this morning. Ephesians, chapter 1, as we make our way through the Word this morning. If you need a, a Bible, you can raise your hand. Somebody will bring one to you. Um, but like I, like kind of I normally say, if not, if you need to boot it up or whatever, go for it. And as long as we get the Word out and we're looking at what God has said. So Ephesians, chapter 1. We're picking up at the second half of of chapter one of the book of Ephesians, and it's it's an awesome it's an awesome book. It's one of those ones you could read through, and Paul squeezes so many things into just the small section of scripture. We have to like slow down and zoom in a little bit, otherwise you could read through this and miss a whole lot of stuff. So I'm thankful uh, that that's what we're doing this morning. But we Paul last week we started with Paul reminding us that we are blessed in Christ. You guys remember that? We are so blessed in Christ. He reminded us that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So we're blessed with a lot of blessings. Every spiritual blessing that we could have is given to us in Christ. And let me just say really quickly, the opposite of that coin is to be without Christ is not to have spiritual blessing. You're missing on the spiritual blessing. That's not to say you couldn't have a, 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 a cool moment in life or get the chills or just have a real happy situation or celebra celebratory thing happen in life. It's not that there won't be blessings in life, but the, the real deep spiritual blessings you're, you'll be without. You know, and you know, I think when I'm thinking about that, I think, may I be bold enough to just say, if you're here this morning and you're not in Christ, I pray that you're extra empty so that you'll know your need for Christ. That there's a hollowness. I pray that for some of my loved ones. Man, I don't know if they like me or not, but I'm praying, God, get them. And if you need to bring an extra emptiness into their life so they're going, what is life about? Is it just living for the weekend? Isn't there a song about that? Is it just living for the weekend? I'm not going to sing it. I don't really know it. I mean, there's got to be more. And, and I pray, God, bring them to that place in life where they think there's got to be more. And then show them your love. Show them who you are. Open their eyes. We'll get to that a little bit later. So the opposite of having the riches of those full spiritual blessings and the full cup, so to speak, in our lives is to not have Christ and to not have those blessings. And from there, Paul went on uh, with a little list of the blessings that we have in Christ. And he started with the blessings of the Father. I'm just going to recap really quickly, kind of take a running start at what we're looking at this morning. And the first one was, you were chosen in him before the foundation of the earth. You were picked. God picked you. You were predestined to adoption. You're, his, you're picked to be his kid. We looked at this last week. I mean, God, he, he, he bought us, he purchased us, he cleansed us, he saved us, he brought us out of, like Bob said earlier, he brought us out of darkness into, I don't know why, but for some reason when, when, when Bob was saying that, like, I'm sitting at this place and, you know, usually you go to an event like that, people are all drinking, there's bad conversations, you're just kind of like, if you've been out of that for a while, you feel like somebody just spit up on your boot. You're like, oh man, that's tough, <laughs> Spiritually, I'm like, ew, you know. And, and to come back and sit in the park and worship God out in public, the only word that was coming to my mind was from darkness into his marvelous light. Marvelous light. Such a, such a big contrast. But Paul says, 
You've been, you've been adopted. Now, he didn't have to adopt us. He could have just saved us and washed us and cleansed us and said, now you're going to heaven and we would have been happy. But he took it a step further and said, I want you to be my kid and my family. I'm watching out for you. I want you to be in my home. What an awesome thing. And then all of this we get because we are accepted in Christ. And the way Paul put that last week is the most beautiful depiction. And personally, I hope it just like resonates in your soul when you hear that description there in Ephesians chapter 1, the beginning. Let's see, what verse is it? It's verse... Sorry, squeaked a little bit. There it is. It's at the end of verse 6. By which he made us accepted in the beloved. Paul's definition, his word for Christ is the beloved. And man, I hope when you hear that, you go, yes. My beloved is Jesus. My beloved, the one. The one who I love, there's everything to me, and I love that Paul used that. We get all this because we are accepted, and the acceptance of being found in Christ is absolutely amazing. And, and so the next thing we see, verses 7 through 12, in the second section, is in him, that is in Christ, we have redemption, which means he purchased you. You've been bought. You've been purchased and the purchase price was his blood. We looked at last week. The life is in the blood. And by his blood, we've been, what does it say? Forgiven of all our offenses. All of our offenses that we have before God. And you guys know as well as I do, there's offenses that we do that we know we've done. Like, oops, that was a bad one. I shouldn't have done that. We've offended God. There's also offenses that we do just because our nature is sinful. We don't even know. And we're offensive to God. Every offense has been forgiven by his blood. Also, and he didn't leave it there, he showed us the mystery of our blessed future, our inheritance, the hope that we have. And he's given us a purpose that's been predestined. He's given us a destiny that's predetermined by God. That means it's not like, willy-nilly. It's not like random, like random happenstance. It's a part of God's plan that we who've trusted in Christ should be giving praise to his glory because of all that he's done. And then lastly, I mean, last but not least, verses 13 and 14, in him, after you've heard and you trusted the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the good news of your salvation, having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of promise. That means God has put his seal. He's put his mark on you. He's called you his and said, he's mine and I'm going to prove it. I'm going to give him the spirit. It's our guarantee. It's the guarantee, the Holy Spirit, the filling of the spirit of our inheritance until we're with him. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that, I think that is good news. How amazing it is. And it changes everything about who I believe that I am when I listen to who God says I am. It's so important for us. There's so many voices that want to tell us what we are in this world. But the most important one is the voice of God saying who you are to us. It's something that personally, as I was going through this study, I was thinking, man, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Paul. I need that reminder in my own life of who I am in Christ. So now we go from this amazing depiction of the blessings that we have in Christ to another run-on sentence. Now, I don't know if you were here last week, but verses 3 through 14 was one sentence in the original Greek. One sentence. Now, I could just see if Paul's there and he's dictating this to a scribe, I bet the scribe's going, Paul, wait, you know, just take a breath. Hold on one second. Big old sentence. Now, in verses 15 through 23, it's another full run-on sentence. It's two sentences, and Paul's not breathing a whole lot. He's so excited about how much we have in Christ. He's just speaking it. He's just going for it. But in, 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 in this second section, excuse me, a little stutter there, in verse 15, um, this is one of the two prayers recorded in the book of Ephesians, in the letter of Ephesians. 
And so we, we, well, let's dig in. Verse 15, Paul says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So before Paul actually begins his prayer, he starts talking about how some of the blessings that he's heard of the church in Ephesus, how amazing uh, this church in Ephesus is. There's a couple of things that mark them, and the first one is that they have a great faith. They have, a, they have an awesome faith. They have a belief and a trust in God. And the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith is one of those things. It can be difficult. I can find myself uh, like the father of the, I think it was the young boy, could have been a girl, I can't remember, recall, in the Gospel of Mark that was standing before Jesus, and Jesus said, I'm, I'm going to heal your child. Do you believe? And he said, I believe. Help my unbelief. That's not a bad thing to say to Jesus. That's a good thing. Say, Lord, I believe, and I'm struggling right now. That's what that says. I'm having a hard time. I'm looking at life, and I'm going, this is tough. So will you help my unbelief? And these Ephesians, they're known for trusting in God. Whatever's coming down the road, they have a faith. They have a trust that God's going to be with them, that he's there, that he has a purpose, a plan, that, that all things will work together for good. And the second thing that they have is a great love, and it's not for Jesus, although it is for Jesus. A great love for who? For the saints, for all the saints. So they are just this people that love each other. And it's, it's, to me, it's... It's an awesome thing to see. Now, really quickly, this isn't in my notes, but I want to mention this. Later on down the road, a lot later down the road, very end of the Bible down the road, book of Revelation, Jesus writes to the church at Ephesus, and he has one thing against them. You guys remember what that is? They lost or left their first love. And I look at this church, great in faith, great in love, and I think about that letter that Jesus wrote, and I think if the church, if this awesome church is susceptible to having their fervor go out or start to fizzle, so am I. And I think, Lord, help us to be strong in love. Help us to continue in love. Man, love is essential in the church. And Lord, give us a love like them for one another. And how awesome it is. So, Basically, they're doing pretty good uh, from what Paul is saying. They have faith. They have love. And Paul says, because I heard that, I have not ceased to give thanks for you and to pray for you. And I look at that and go, praise God. Absolutely. First thing I see there is, well, we should be praying for one another. But actually, the bigger kind of conviction is to me. Because I'm looking at Paul here as a pastor, as somebody who founded this church. And he says, I'm praying for you. And so when I look at that and I look at the scripture and think about my place, I'm thinking, Lord, help me to pray more. I want to pray more for you guys, for the struggles you're going through, for the difficulties that you're facing. There's so many times in life when the decision comes across our path. Am I going to stand for God or am I going to do something else? And I want to be in prayer for that. Not only that, the difficult things, the medical things, all the stuff that's going on in life. And I look at this and I think, man, this is, this is it convicts me. Lord, help me to pray more for the people here that you've entrusted to me. An old pastor once said this, I don't know which one has a greater effect on the church, my preaching or my praying. And I tend to think it's probably the prayers. And I think of what Jesus said. He says, when I return, when I come to church, will I find my people preaching? No. Praying. Will my house be a house of prayer? It's such an important and powerful thing. And then we look here, what, what, what does Paul, how does Paul pray here? There's really one thing that describes how he's praying. I mean, he says he's giving thanks. That's more like the kind of prayer that he's praying. But how does he give thanks and make mention? It's without ceasing. Paul's praying without ceasing. You know, Paul instructs us to do the same thing in the first letter to the church at Thessalonica in chapter 5. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always, 
Pray without ceasing and in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Pray without ceasing. Another one. This is another one of those things. When I, when I read that, it's convicting to me because it's my desire to pray without ceasing. Now, pray without ceasing, I mean, it's not like we're going to say, oh, oh, excuse me, don't talk to me right now. I'm praying without ceasing, right? I mean, just, this is not the idea. The idea is as we walk through life, we're continually talking with the Holy Spirit. We're continually saying, Jesus, help me in this situation that I'm heading into right now. Lord, help me as I'm coming out of this situation. Continuing to have in my, let me just say this. What is the biggest key to any relationship? Communication. And Paul says, I'm going to be praying without ceasing. I'm going to be communicating on your behalf without ceasing. And I, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. But it's one of those things that Paul commands us to do. The word commands us to do. And I, I think we can do that. But Lord, I, at least where I'm at, I say, Lord, just help me more in that. I want to talk to you. I want to be focused on you throughout the day. And I believe we should strive for this kind of closeness and relationship. It's one thing that we can do also from that scripture in uh, 1 Thessalonians. It's one thing that we can do and we can know that we're in the will of God. I mean, have you ever had this thought like, I wish I knew exactly the will of God, like right now. I have that so many times. I'm like, Lord, I just want to know. And he's like, well, you just walk in faith. I'm like, no, that's not, that's not what I'm talking about. I want you to tell me what to do, right? I want to just know, then I'll do it. Well, this is one of those places in the Bible where we can know that these things are in the will of God. Rejoicing always, praying without ceasing, giving thanks in everything. Paul says, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And when I read those, man, I think it's, an, it's a fruitfulness. It's an attitude that should be in our lives. Rejoicing always, talking to Jesus, and giving thanks, having an attitude of gratitude as we walk through life. And lastly, when I think about praying, I think that we as a body of believers should be in continual prayer for each other. You know, Paul had, he had a lot of churches that he was an, a, a pastor, sort of an overseer over. He started a whole bunch of churches. And we're a part of one church. Of course, we have the greater church, and we have uh, other people in the family of Christ. There's people I'm sure that we're connected to that go to different churches in town. We should be praying for all of those. But God also plugs us into a church. And so this morning, I just have the thought, if this is the one for you, we need to be praying for one another, right? We need to be praying for one another. And so, and of course, always, <laughs> I covet your prayers. Oh my goodness, pray for me, absolutely. If you haven't been praying for me, please begin to pray for me as well. We are heading into an interesting season of life. Let me just tell you really quick. I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm old. Now you probably, I know, I know, you're laughing at me. But I'm having a baby at this age, okay? That's, that's the qualification. So we're, we're heading into a season. Yeah, my wife's like, excuse me, I'm here. I'm having the baby. You're right. You're right. So if you would, pray for our family and, and pray for me as well. All right, so let's get into this. Uh, let's get into this prayer of Paul's here, starting in verse 17. He says, The prayer is that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And so Paul starts out this prayer. I, I just have to note really quickly. I was reading this and I thought, man, what a beautiful title for God. He says there, right after the first comma, at least in my Bible, the Father of glory. And just how beautiful that is, the Father of glory. But he's asking that God, the Father of glory, would give them, and I'll say us as well, the spirit of wisdom, and that he would give them revelation. The spirit of wisdom and of revelation. 
when I look at this, when I think about it, but it's not just for the benefit of receiving those gifts or receiving those things or so that they could be like super spiritual in appearance or prophesy and predict an event uh, or have special insights for the church. Paul's praying that the church at Ephesus would be given the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And the whole reason for this wisdom and revelation that Paul is asking God to give, uh, that, that Paul is asking God to give to the church, and he's praying this in for the church of Ephesus, is for or to this end that they would have bestowed upon them the knowledge of God. Man, it's so important for us to know God. It's so important for us to know Jesus. And the proper knowing of God gives us a, a platform or a firm foundation in life for so many things. But one of them is simply to know ourself. God's word gives us a proper foundation to know ourselves. To know or to endeavor to know ourselves apart from the knowledge of God is a very tricky endeavor. I would say it's a deceptive endeavor because, and the Bible reveals to us, our own heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. And in Jeremiah 17, 10, he says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. The answer is God knows us, and it's a, it's a especially tricky thing to look inward and try to figure ourselves out because we deceive ourselves in pride. We deceive ourselves in pride. It happens. I mean, there are so many attitudes in our life that are pride, self-preservation, um, false humility. It's a, it's a form of pride. And we're able to deceive ourselves into thinking we're okay. And people do it. We do it all the time. How important it is for us to know God. An old, an old commentator said this, For philosophy comes to a man with the message, Know thyself. The gospel meets him with a far more glorious and fruitful watchword, Know thy God. So before we move on, one more thought on revelation and the spirit of revelation, and that is this. When I hear this wisdom and revelation revealed to us, given to us by the spirit, there's a few thoughts that come to mind. The first one is this. God has already revealed himself to us in two humongous ways. The first one is through who? Jesus. In fact, when the disciples said, just show us the Father and it'll be enough, Jesus says, have I been with you so long? If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus is a revelation of God for us. And the second revelation is right here. It's the word. It's what we're going through this morning. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. My word is truth. Now, really quickly, when I think about the spirit of revelation, I think, well, who is the spirit? What is the spirit of revelation? And it's the spirit of promise. It's the same spirit that Jesus has given to us who has a few tasks, if you remember, one of them to bring to remembrance all the things that Jesus has said. And I'm thankful for that. So our helper, our spirit. The Holy Spirit, or, or maybe I should say my Holy Spirit. I, I, I like to get personal when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we talk about the Holy Spirit like it's the force from Star Wars, right? That's not what it is. It's a person of God who wants to come and live in us and walk with us in this life. And may he be with and in us, amen? So at the end of that very first little, I, I kind of took a while there to, to chew on that first little nugget. I, I want to pray every one of these aspects of the prayer. I want to pray it for us. So God, would you give us by your spirit wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you? Amen. 
So the next part of his prayer, we're going to read this section and go through the little chunks, verses 18 and 19, is that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. So there's sort of a description here of what this knowledge and this revelation of God is going to look like in our lives. First one is Paul prays that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, which I just have to note, this is the spiritual work of God to open our eyes, to give us understanding and revelation of who he is. It's a spiritual work and it's a very necessary thing in our lives. There are so many things in this world, in ourselves, um, the enemy, the, the, the deceiver wants to keep the eyes of our heart darkened to the things of God. I mean, we, we, we're our own worst enemy so often when it comes to this thing. In fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, that we, we see dimly, spiritually speaking, as in a mirror. So we already see sort of dimly, we need the work of God to open our eyes to who he is. And I, I again, um, I have to just say, let's pray that again right now. God, would you open the eyes of our understanding and enlighten us to know you and to grow in you? It's a necessary thing. Just another side note on this. This is often what I pray over family members or people that I know that don't believe, that, that don't trust in the Lord. I pray, God... Would you give them a moment of clarity where they could hear the gospel and see you with that clarity? And not the distorted voices that seek to dim that more and say, oh no, that wasn't God. It was a coincidence. Personally, between you and me, I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in God. I believe that he's oversees our life and that when things happen, it, it's either that or like I think Mike Wing has said before, I, I'm sorry, but I guess there's just millions of coincidences in my life. Which is to say, no, God. The next thing Paul lists here is that we would know what is the hope of his calling. It's another important thing for the believer. Is that we would know or that we would be assured of or assured of the calling that God has on our life because knowing God's calling gives us hope. Knowing that God's calling us and what he's calling us to do is something that gives us hope. And another facet of knowing the hope of God's calling is that this hope of our calling has its focus on the future. God has called me now to walk this moment forward in a calling in our life. And you might be here this morning and say, I, I'm, I don't know the hope of my calling. I don't understand. I, I would challenge you in this, to get with the Lord and to sit with him and ask him. And then to move, and I pray, may it be for us from this moment forward that we step into whatever calling God's putting on our life and we walk forward in that and we get a glorious hope of saying, yes to whatever God has called us into life. It gives us that purpose. It gives us that hope. Like, I'm here for a reason. My life means something because of God's calling on my life, no matter what anyone else says. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been in a room of people that think they're all somebody. Sometimes you can leave that conversation going, man, I'm nothing. But then you got to have that remembrance, and hopefully the Holy Spirit does it in your heart and says, no, you're not nothing. You are somebody with a plan. Those things lead to nothing. All those people thinking they know something or there's somebody big, that is going to be a hill of beans in heaven. And the little things that we go through, that we step into that little calling, it might be really small. Then we're faithful. Those are nuggets, gold nuggets, solid gold in heaven. And when we step into the calling that he has in our life. And again, like I said, that includes our future, but also includes the hope of our calling, our eternal future in heaven. Oh man, we need to have our, our hearts fixed on this once again, because I don't know about you, but I can look around at the world today and go, huh? oh. I mean, I look at my country and I just think, what in the world? Are we in America? 
Where are we at? I don't even know. Now, we can get maybe a little hope sometimes and think maybe somebody will come in and have put things sort of back. But even in that, I go, that's such a small hope. Compared to the fact that I'm not home yet, my home is eternal. There is such a hope when I can get my eyes off of all the things going on and go, all I know is I'm not home yet because this is not where I belong. And then this life, the longer I'm here, what I realize is it's, it's just more evident this ain't my home. This is not my, my home. And so we get to look forward to that glorious hope of our future. So let's say the prayer. Lord, help us to know what is the hope of your calling on our life and help us to step into that. The next thing Paul is praying is that the Ephesians would know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Now, you could just kind of read over that and think, yeah, Lord, what are the riches of my inheritance? What's going on? Because usually we see the word inheritance in the scripture, and it's about me. It's my inheritance. It's what I get. It's heaven, or it's a blessing that I get. But I don't know if you noticed, we're not talking about our inheritance. We're talking about God's inheritance. Wait a minute. God's inheritance which are described as riches and glorious. And what are they? It's you guys. You're the riches and the glory of God's inheritance. I don't know about you, but when I think about that, my little mind goes poof, and I think, man, God, you sure got the raw end of the deal. <laughs> me? You get me? E, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's, I'm sorry that's what you get. But this is the truth. This is the truth of what we're seeing here. Yes, that is what it says. And that idea, that thought does a couple of things in our hearts, in our minds, in our psyche, in the way that we think. Because it does a couple of things. Number one, it makes us look a little differently about ourselves because of how God views us. You're his treasure. You're his beloved. When he looks at life, he definitely doesn't hold high and valuable the things the world does. He holds high and valuable us. You're the treasure of God. And he looks at you as his beloved. You're the everything. You're what all of this is for. You're what, what he gave his son for, his most precious thing. So it makes us think a little bit differently about ourselves, and it should. I, I would challenge you, let that change the way you look at yourself as the riches and the glory, but also it should help us shape our love and our thinking towards one another because that person sitting next to you that might be driving you up the wall is God's treasure, is God's beloved, right? I know, and so it changes no matter how difficult a person is. I don't know what kind of personality you have. But sometimes a Christian brother or sister comes in and they're just the bubbliest, and you just want to pop the bubble. <laughs> You're like, ah, get away from me. You're sliming me. This is horrible. And, and, and Lord, forgive us because that is God's treasure, this person, this individual. Or maybe there's somebody you know, a Christian, and they're a Christian Eeyore. And you're thinking, man, I wish I could just pin the tail back on you, dude. <laughs> right? This is one of those things, though, where I think, I look at this, I say, God, forgive me for when your sheep may rub me the wrong way. God, help me to be more aware of how valuable people are to you. God, may it change my life, the way that I live, the things that I do, and may I treat people, may we treat each other as such, as the precious treasure of God. And so we say this prayer, Lord, help us to know what are the riches of the glory of your inheritance in us. And the last thing in this section that Paul is praying that the church in Ephesus would know is the greatness of his power towards us who believe. The greatness of his power toward us who believe. And let me just say really quickly, his power is great. 
It is great. And we're going to look at that here in just a second because the section as he moves on into, Paul describes the greatness of his power. Look with me at verse 19. It says, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age which is to come. So we get this description of the power of God, the work of God, which is so amazing and so important. And what is the mighty working of Paul that, I'm sorry, of God that Paul describes and proclaims to us? It was in the raising of Jesus from the dead which is something to kind of chew on and think about. Of all the things that Paul could have described about God's power, he, he talks about Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Interesting, because when I think about this, I think, okay, I don't know about you, but I, when I think of power, a lot of times I think maybe horsepower, wrong kind, it's the Tim Allen stuff, right? <laughs> Whatever he does, horsepower. Uh, I think about that kind of power, and I think, Paul, you could have said so many things. You could have talked about, I don't know, the flood. That's power, man, the whole earth being flooded. And then when the waters receded and the, and the, the, the crust of the earth was shifting and mountains were coming up, I'm like, that's power. Or he could have went to the creation week and said, well, you know, before all of this stuff, God spoke the universe into existence by the power of his word. That's power. It's huge power. And then when I, when I start to think about the universe, my little itty-bitty mind just goes pop. You know, it's like, uh, it's so big. It's so vast. It's so huge. And then I think about, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie. Uh, it's, it's a documentary called The Purpose, The Privileged Planet, I believe. The Privileged Planet. You should check that one out. Look it up. I think it's on YouTube. The Privileged Planet, where this science professor, he's studying, really he's studying uh, space, but he's studying the sun and the moon and when they have an eclipse. And you can perfectly study solar flares because the sun and the moon perfectly overlap and eclipse one another, just like absolutely perfectly. And I don't know if you know this, but they're not the same size. And there are different distances. And it just happens to be the exact perfect distance, the exact perfect size offset, so that that works out. And it starts getting him thinking. And he starts realizing that where planet Earth is, is located in such a position that we have a clear view of the galaxy and the universe. Like, we could have been put in a spot where we wouldn't be able to see really anything. It would be like a cloud uh, in, of whatever it is, gases or whatever, in, in the space around us, we wouldn't be able to see a thing. But he starts realizing, like, all of this whole universe really seems like it's all for a purpose so that people can live and look out into the universe and have life on this little planet, this little blueberry planet that's like a speck in the midst of our universe. Anyways, sorry, I'm kind of babbling on a rabbit trail here, but this is an amazing thing. Check it out, the privileged planet. But to think about his creation or his power, our perfect placement in the universe, in the Milky Way galaxy. Man, Paul could have described so many different things about his power. He could have described, when I thought of earthquakes and quaking, uh, you ever been asked the question, well, could God make a rock so big that he couldn't lift it? I, I immediately, when I was first asked that question, I said, of course he can make a rock so big that he can't lift it. But then he's God. So he could lift. He probably could lift it. But wait a minute. If he made it bigger, though. Ah, anyways, your brain, it fries. What do you think about stuff like that? No, but what God used to show, what Paul used to demonstrate, to show his mighty power, was the resurrection of Jesus. And as I was thinking about this and thinking about some of the things that happened when Jesus died and rose, I was thinking about the power that happened. I thought, you know, God could have used an, a, an earthquake, the, the earth to tremble. And then I thought, oh, wait a second, he did that. When Jesus died, the earth shook as a representation of the power of God in the resurrection and in the death and in his payment for sin. 
And then I thought, well, you know, he, he probably could have just made a, a perfectly bright day as dark as night. Oh, wait a second. He did do that when Jesus died, so much so that when Pilate saw him die and release his own spirit, he said, this is the Son of God. Not Pilate, the centurion guard. This truly was the Son of God. He was convinced at the death because of these things that happened. God did make it abundantly clear. But if you think about it, the resurrection, it does portray the power of God, both physically and spiritually. Physically, because Jesus rose bodily and there's an empty tomb in Jerusalem to prove that our Savior lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul has a little section of scripture in here where all he's doing is defending the resurrection bodily of Jesus from the grave. He says this, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve, Cephas being Peter, and then by the twelve, and after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have died, some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, and then by all the apostles. And then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. What Paul is saying here is he's not trying to embellish the story. He's saying this is a historical account, Corinthians, and most of these people are still alive. Go talk to them. They'll tell you that Jesus is alive because they saw him alive. It's an eyewitness record that Paul gives in the Bible for us to say we have this hope and assurance. Jesus is risen. There is an empty tomb. And I'm telling you, go research it. That's what Paul is saying to these churches. So we have that truth. And now he's seated in heaven, the right hand of the Father. So we have this Physically, another physical demonstration of the power is because it deals with the problem that all people have in this life, a big problem that we have no power over, and that is death. Fun, interesting note. 100 people out of 100 people will die. Right? Little fun fact. You could say that any way you want. 10 out of every 10 people will die. One out of every one will die. This is something that we all face. And so the fact that Jesus conquered it is power. And it's power for us. It's something so that we can now believe in the truth of what Jesus said about our future resurrection, that he is the firstborn of the raised from the dead people. We're going to get a body like his. It's going to be cool. I mean, you might think your body's cool. It's going to be way cooler. I'm just saying. And spiritually, of course. We all have the issue of spiritually, of the next life, of what happens when we die. And we all have the problem of not knowing apart from what God has said, right? You could have the thought, well, when I die, I'm just going to go hang out at great grandma's house. I haven't been there in a really long time, so I'll just head over there. But the truth is, you don't know, nobody knows what's going to happen when we die, except what's been revealed to us in Scripture. So there's a sense of this that... What happens when we die, our soul, it's out of our hands. It's out of our control. But I say there's a sense of it because if we put our trust in Jesus and accept him as our Lord and Savior, we actually have controlled our eternal destination. And we've put it right on the right bearing to where we're going to be with him, the author, the founder of life in heaven. And so spiritually... Also spiritually, this shows us that God accepted the sacrifice, the death of his son for our sins, because now he's alive by the power of God, and he's sitting at the right hand of God. I want to I end this section about the resurrection power of God with a quote from Spurgeon. I, I think it's pointed, and I think it's powerful. Spurgeon said, many Christians do not know this power, or... They only know it from a distance. God wants resurrection life to be real in the life of the believer. The very same power which raised Christ is waiting to raise the drunken man from his drunkenness. It's waiting to raise the thief from his dishonesty. It's waiting to raise the Pharisee from his self-righteousness and the Sadducee from his unbelief. So the question for us 
is do we know this power? Have we experienced this power? The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. Let me get a little more insight into this power, and we're, and we're just about to close up here, wrapping it up this morning. We get a little bit more insight into this power in verse 21. Paul says, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this age, but in that which is to come, which is to say Jesus, spiritually speaking and physically in his body, he's seated in heaven far above all other authority. And that's the idea here. When it says principality and power, the idea is rank and authority spiritually. So Jesus is above the rank and authority of any of the created angels. Also, he's above in rank and authority any of the demons that fell, the fallen angels. He's above all of them. And it's really, it doesn't compare. They're under his feet. Then also it says might and dominion, which speaks of any mighty act or act of power or miracle or any ruler in government. Thank you, Lord. The assurance that we have that he's, he's over all those things. And every name to come, so that of all the people that have been born into this life or that will be in the future, Jesus is over every single one of them. You know, when I think about the honor that Jesus has as being over everything, the honor that the Father has given the Son upon the completion of his winning our salvation by loving us and dying on the cross, I think rightly so. He should be placed above every other name. He's beat everything. He's beat our enemy. He set us free. Then in verse 22 and 23, as we close this morning, and if Beth's out there, I'd have her come up. In verse 22, and, and he put all things under his feet, and he gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And that little couple of verses is, again, so rich. There's so much in here. He put all things under the feet of Jesus. Every power, every name, everything is under him. And he gave him to be the head over all things to the church. God gave Jesus to be head over all things to the church. When I read that, I think, is this saying what I think it says? Is it saying that Jesus is my reward? That he's been given? And, and I think, what a gift we have in Jesus. That he would be in us. That he would use us. I, it blows my mind that we have that power, that authority given in Christ to the church. And I believe this is truly the best gift, the greatest gift ever been given to us by our Father is his Son. Is my Jesus. He's the best gift I've ever received. And I hope, again, this is one of those things where I hope this resonates in your soul and you can say wholeheartedly, Amen. My Jesus is my everything. What he's done for me, the way that he's made for me. And then he says that we are his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, this is interesting. Paul is revealing to us just how amazing and glorious it is that we receive Jesus. And then he says, and we are his body. Now, he's talking about the church. But really quickly, I want you to think about this. What is a body? Is a body who you are? It's really how people recognize you, but it's not who I really am. Who I really am is in my body. My body's more like a tool, right? I, I can take it and do stuff and have fun and relate to people with it. It's just a thing. It's a created thing. It's how we get stuff done. Well, well Paul is telling us here, you are the body of Jesus. You are that to Jesus. 
We are the representative of Jesus to those who are around us. We're, we're the hands and feet of Jesus. We're that thing that Jesus fills us and we go be Jesus to people. We're his body. And I, I think about that and I, I think we are the fullness of God to other believers and to the lost people in this world. Immediately, I think, I don't know, God, I'm not the fullness of you to people around me. I need help. <laughs> and he's like, okay, well, you need help? Well, then I'll be all in you. I'll be the help you need to be the light to the people around so that you can be the hands and feet, so that you can be the representative, so that you can let people know there's so much more to life than the dumb stuff you've been living for. There's so much more to receive, there's so much more to have, and that we would show that primarily by love, by being loved to people. And it's not of us, he's all, and he's in all. And again, this points to the importance and the necessity of us allowing the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and our lives. We're not going to be the difference on our own in our own strength. We need him to be all and in all. And as I close this morning, another commentary said, and I, this is just an awesome thought, just to kind of stop and pause and, and to think about. Jesus is over everything. He's over all the angels, all of creation. I mean, there's some descriptions of angels in the Bible that will make our, our head spin. I mean, they are, no, no wonder whenever anybody saw an angel in the Bible, they usually fell on their face and shook and were like, worship. And they'd say, no, don't worship me. I'm not God. Uh-uh, don't do that. But angels are, I mean, there's some descriptions of angels. I don't think they'd be able to fit in this room. I'm just saying. They'd be curled up in a fetal position in the back of the room. Hey, guys, if they were behind me, right? And they're under... They're under Jesus, but mystery of all mysteries, they're under him, but he is in you. He's in us. And I just, <laughs> my mind's blown. A couple of thoughts come to my mind. The first one is, I, I think that's a little insight into why Lucifer fell. You know, you're going to be in those people, and I'm under you, and all, uh, no, no way, mind blown. My, my mind's blown the same way. Only my mind is blown to go, God, you're so good. I can't understand it, but I want every single thing that you mentioned today. I want that in my life. So the call this morning is, do you have the filling of the Spirit in your life? Do you have the seal, the mark of God in the Holy Spirit? And I want to just take a moment to pray. So if you would stand, I'm just going to pray for my own self here. I'm sorry, I'm selfish. But just agree and pray the same in your own heart. And Lord, I want to come before you and ask for your apology, God. I mean, ask for an apology on my own behalf, Lord, to, to come before you and say, God, I, I misrepresent you so often, Lord. And I live too often for myself. And I pray, God, that you'd fill me with your spirit and the same power that raised Jesus from the grave so that I could be your body your representation to the world around us, to the lost, the hurting, the broken that don't need to see me. They need to see you. God, they need to see Christ is all in all. And so this morning, Lord, we pray for your spirit. Holy Spirit, would you fill us? Would you fill us, God? Lord, that we would have the strength to be your hands and your feet.
against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus and so Lord now I, I pray over the church God I pray over your bride Lord, this is what you just showed us. This is your treasure. This is your love. This is your great reward and your beloved. And I pray, God, that you would fill your church. God, I pray that you would move us, change us. Lord, that we would be ambassadors for you. Lord, that we would be love to those around us that need to know the truth of who they are and who they were destined to be in Christ. God, I pray that you would continue to move. And I know that as long as there's breath in our lungs, you have a plan for us. And we want to be a part of it. We don't want to miss it, God. So we thank you. We praise you. We ask that you would have your way in us be glorified, be lifted high, be magnified, Jesus. You're so good. Your great love for us, all the blessings you've given us. Thank you so much, God, for the solid foundation of your word, God. And so I pray that you would, again, fill and move, that you would be all in all in this body. We ask, we want this, we, we beg of you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.